السلام عليكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد Brothers and sisters, you cannot imagine the great honor I feel tonight or this afternoon to address you, but also a sense of the great weight. I believe any time a speaker speaks uh, to people, while it is a great honor and privilege, but also is a tremendous responsibility. And I want so much to say what is right. Brothers and sisters, I am not a politician. I don't know how to do that. In, in fact, in New York City, we call um, polit politics among us, we call it politrix. And tonight or this afternoon, I'm going to say a lot of things, some of which some of you will agree with, others you will not. In this day and time when Muslims speak to audiences that are mixed, it is important to be, to be honest. Thank you. Thank you. And factual. One of the great prophets, Prophet Ibrahim, alayhi salat wa salam, known to Christians and Jews as Abraham, he made a supplication. And when I learned about this supplication, it has been my own supplication. رَبَّنَا لَتَجْعَلْنَا فِئْنَةِ لِلَّذِينَ كَفِرُوهُ O Allah, do not make us a trial for those who disbelieve. And I don't want to be a trial for anyone. I want to say something that's going to help you. To get closer to Allah. You know, brothers and sisters, um, I was invited by some of the brothers to play basketball tonight. Yeah, I play basketball. And I'm pretty good too, <laughs> if I might say so myself. But basketball, like other team sports, like football and baseball, you always have two aspects of the game. You have the offense and you have defense. It is the objective of these sports to score more points than your opponent. And no matter how good you are defensively, you can't win until you score points. It is my opinion that the Muslim Ummah have been on a defense, especially since 9-11. It seems as if we're always in the position to defend ourselves. While people strike blow after blow, we continue on the ropes defending ourselves and our posture has been one of a defensive posture. When my coach taught us how to play basketball, he taught us that there were two schools of thought 
Whenever the opponent presses you, one school of thought, you kind of pass the ball from side to side, the closest man to you until you break the press. But my coach taught me, whenever they press you, you ought to be aggressive and throw the ball over the defenders and go and toward the basket to score a basket. And when you do that, they'll stop pressing you. And so does my opinion that my observation all over the world, I'm looking at Muslims in this defensive posture. I don't know about you, I, I, I don't mind playing defense, but I like to play offense once in a while. So tonight, I'm, or this afternoon, I'm gonna do a little offense too, if you don't mind. I think that these topics are important. Preaching peace, tolerance. Islam teaches all of this against extremism. But it seems to me over the last six or seven months, even longer than that, over and over and over again, Muslims are saying the same thing. We didn't do it. We didn't do it. Islam doesn't teach that. Islam doesn't teach that. I think while we should tell the truth about that, but I think also we should remember our mission. And this afternoon, I'm going to remind you about our job description and what we're supposed to be doing. A few years ago, I went to a Muslim country And you can choose one of them, one of 45 countries where Muslims are the dominant population. Don't ask me which country, okay? But I attended the Juma prayer, Friday prayer service, in the largest masjid in that country. And as I was sitting there and the imam was given the sermon, I looked around the masjid and I was shocked to find so many people sleeping. Now, I'm talking about sure enough sleep. In the Arabic language, the word nama means to sleep. He slept. Nama, he slept. Namat, she slept. But when you study Arabic grammar, and you get a, what's called derivative verb, the verb anama doesn't mean to sleep, but it means to put someone to sleep. When the mother has her young baby, I was on the plane this morning coming from um, uh, Atlanta, Georgia, and man, there was a baby behind me, woo-wee. Had some lungs, man. And everybody looking. And the mother was trying to anamat, try to put the baby to sleep. In the old days, we called them lullaby. The mother would sing a lullaby. She would sing because she's trying to put the baby to sleep. The baby is making too much noise, and, and the mother wants to do something, so she has to lull the baby to sleep. It is my opinion that the masses of the people in America and around the world are sound asleep. I'm clear about that. And not only are, are the majority of the people sleep, somebody is putting them to sleep. While I like basketball, I'd rather play it than watch it. What do I look like sitting down watching uh, Kobe make millions of dollars? Yeah, go on, Kobe. Go, Kobe. And he said, yeah. And he's getting paid. I'm not getting paid. So I'd rather play it 
then watch it. If you look now in sports, basketball, football, baseball, hockey, even like, like black people didn't hardly used to watch tennis. But now they're watching tennis because of the Williams sisters. I think one is playing today. Golf. Black people never watch golf. <laughs> now with Tiger Woods, everybody watching it. All of these things, all of these activities, in my opinion, so much lull people to sleep. Someone knows what they're doing. And the masses of the people, in my opinion, are asleep. Is an interesting uh, a verse in the 18th chapter of the Quran. Allah said that, he was talking about those who were asleep in the cave. He said, you would think them awoke, but they were asleep. Hmm. So sometimes, sometimes people can fool you. So I used to be a school, I used to be a teacher, right? And students have a way now of looking like they're awoke, they're like, See, but I know that look. There's a look. See, no, no. The eyes are open, but they, they're gone. So, brothers and sisters, while I will speak about this topic tonight, I want to talk about this topic in the right perspective. Preaching peace. Especially in coexistence in this multicultural society. It's a fact, Muslims we can get along with, with, with other people. We have about uh, 1.5 billion people around the earth, Muslims around the earth. And one third of them are in non-Muslim countries. So where do you find them? You find them in America, you find them in Europe, you find them in Africa, you find them all over the, all over the world. In America, less than 3% of the population are Muslims, probably some 7 million or more Muslims in America surrounded by Christians and Jews and Buddhists and Hindus and atheists and all of these people, and yet we can live together in peace. There's no problem with that. If you look at the different religions, all of these religions, each one of them have their own identity, their unique identity, and so do Muslims. And if you want to know the identity of the Muslims, the, the makeup of the Muslims, the posture of the Muslims, you have to always go to the Quran and you have to go to the words of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. And Allah mentioned in Quran, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَنَّكُمْ أُمَّةً وُسُطَى لِتَكُونُ شُهَدَ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَيُكُونَ رَسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا And thus have we, Allah, made you, the Muslims, a balanced ummah. And that means everything that we do as Muslims is always down the middle. We neither go too far to the right, no, too far to the left. Always in the middle, that medium nation, that golden nation, that nation that's right down the middle, no extremes. I think the, the theme of this conference is, is great. I think uh, it, it talks about faith and, and action together. I think it's very, very critical. And if you look at the Jewish community, by and large, a community that depends a lot on law, a Torah, and the Christian uh, community, basically a community of faith. And certainly they integrate in some aspects of it, but in general. And what about the Muslims? The Muslims are right down the middle, not dependent only on faith, but at the same time not dependent only on action, but action and faith together. Brothers and sisters, if I walk down the street in Detroit or Los Angeles or New York City, late at night, and someone takes out a gun and put that gun to my head. They can rob me of my wallet. They can even steal my car. They can steal my clothing. But the one thing they can't steal, they can't steal my faith. If faith is something that you can steal, then the robbers would have all the faith and the other people would have none. 
I can give my children many things. I can give my children money. I can give them a good education. I can give them computers. But I can't give them faith. If you don't believe me, ask Prophet Ibrahim, was he able to give faith to his father? Ask Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, was he able to give faith to his uncle Abu Talib? Ask Lot, was he able to give faith to his wife? Ask Noah, was he able to give faith to his son? And that's why Allah says in Quran, "Wa makanili nafsan an tu'mina illa bi idnillah." No one can believe except by the permission of Allah. Children can inherit faith from their parents. You have to get it for yourself. Having said that, brothers and sisters, as Muslims, we have to be more than preachers of peace, more than just advocates of peace. We have to, in fact, establish peace. And that's what I want to talk about to, to this afternoon for a few moments. Now, in my opinion, one of the things that lull people to sleep is too much t television. I believe that television is like money. Money is neither good nor bad. Money in the hand of good people will do good things. And money in the hand of evil people will do evil things. Likewise, television in the hands of good people can do some good things. And television in the hands of bad people can do evil things. Most of the TV, in my opinion, is a waste of time. Having said that, there's one program that I recommend that you watch. I wonder if you can guess what it is. West Wing. West what? Oh, okay. Wild Animal Kingdom. No, I'm serious. You better watch it. I'm going to tell you something that I learned from watching that program. Now, I, Sheikh, uh, I didn't read this in the Quran. I didn't read the Hadith. This is observation. Careful observation has led me to conclude, first of all, there's only two things. It's al-khaliq and makhluq. It's creator and creation. Allah is the creator and everything else is created. Everything is created. Allah is the creator and everything else is created. Observation has led me to see that every animal that God created, every animal that Allah created has a natural enemy. All of them. Have you ever watched some animals eating? You ever watch that? What are they looking for? The enemy. They know instinctively. And when the animal comes, the enemy comes, they know what the enemy is. And then not only did Allah create for them an enemy, but Allah created in every animal a way to defend itself against its enemy or to at least get away from the enemy. So some little bird has no protection. The only thing that it can do is flap its wings and fly away from its enemy. Some animals have blinding speed so they can outrun the enemy. Some animals are able to climb up a tree and get away. Some can burrow in the earth. Some have claws. Some animals are so huge that their mere hugeness, their bulk, is a deterrent. Some animals go inside of a shell and defend themselves. Some animals merely blend in the background and camouflage. And some animals, the only defense that they have is their own stench. And I notice that every animal has a way to defend itself except one. And that is the sheep. Notice the sheep. Have you ever seen the teeth of a sheep? It can't bite meat, can it? 
the hoofs of a, of a sheep. Did you ever see it? Did you ever see a sheep run? Pathetic. <laughs> Why did Allah create a way to defend itself? Every animal but didn't create a way for the sheep to defend itself. The answer can be found, I believe, in a statement of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. He says, مَا بَعَثَ اللَّهَ نَبِيٍ إِلَّا رَعَى غَنْمٍ Allah has never sent a prophet except he first sent him as a shepherd over sheep. The reason that the sheep have no defense is because its defense is the shepherd. I bet you the Bible is replete with images of sheep and shepherds. It would have to be. So the defender of the sheep, the defenseless sheep, is the shepherd. And this is why the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said, Al Imam Ra'in, every one of you is a shepherd and held accountable for the flock. And the first one he said is the Imam. The parents, the father, the mother, a sheep. And I'm telling you something. Your precious little children, your six children, my nine children, and, and, and your Adam, you just got married recently, didn't you? Maybe you're two B10 children, inshallah, or 15. We represent the shepherds for these sheep. So number one, it is my observation that the masses of the people are asleep. And number two, the masses of the people are sheep. I'm clear about that. Having said that, my discussion. Brothers and sisters, we got a tremendous job to do as Muslims in this country. A tremendous job. What has happened is that a few people have caused the world to try to redefine Islam. Do you read one of the basic questions that someone could ask you is, Kam kitab in Qur'ata? Kam kitab in Qur'ati? How many books have you read? Oh, you can tell me about a lot of television programs that you watch. But how many books did you read? What are the people saying about Islam? You will see, brothers and sisters, I read every day. I'm always looking, always reading, always on the internet, newspapers, magazines, books. I want to know what are the people saying. Kenneth Woodward, chief writer for Newsweek magazine said that recent polls reveal that American people have a more favorable opinion about Muslims and Islam since 9-11 than before. And he also said that every college and university that teaches Islam, all those classes are oversubscribed. Now what's happened? If you read literature lately, you will see that Islam is being attacked. What began as a legitimate fight against terrorism, and every Muslim would, would join that fight against terrorism, true? True? Has now become an attack on Islam. Certainly. Would you agree right now that the Quran is under tremendous scrutiny? Don't worry, the Quran can handle it. Not only the Muslims under scrutiny, but the Quran itself, and I can show I have all the articles to show you, magazines, newspaper articles. Uh, written by scholars questioning the very integrity of the Quran itself. And because of that, I believe sincere people who want to know, American people want to know, I would want to know. I would want to know if, if, if Muslim are terrorists and I got a Muslim living next to me, or Muslim in my school, or Muslim on my job, I would want to know what do they teach? 
And because of that, people are now looking in our own text. They're looking in the Quran and they're looking in the words of the Prophet Muhammad, trying to understand what's going on. Can Muslims live in peace anywhere? What are we supposed to expect in America from our Muslim neighbors? Those Muslim neighbors who migrated from Afghanistan. If I have a Muslim living who, who, who migrated from Afghanistan, living in my city, what am I supposed to think about those Muslims? The Muslims who came from Pakistan, the Muslims who came from Egypt, the Muslims who come from Sudan, the Muslims who come from Libya, the Muslims who come from Algeria, the Muslims who come from Muslim countries around the world. What am I supposed to think about them? Can we live together in peace? My answer is, of course, yes, a resounding yes. But I want to go beyond that. Brothers and sisters, it's my opinion that most of us major in the minor. And we minor in the major. What, what do I mean? The real issues that we ought to discuss, we never do. We wind up discussing little, little bitsy issues. Let me give an example. Don't misunderstand what I'm about to say. Don't misunderstand me. Imam, you have my back? The Imam said he got my back. So don't misunderstand me. You see this thing I have on my chin? What's this called? A beard. The only reason I have this beard is because it's the prophet's sunnah. He wore a beard and all the prophets wore beards. So I'm trying to wear a beard like the prophet wore a beard. Now, don't ask a man, how come you have a beard? That's the wrong question. Asking a man, how come he has a beard, is like asking a woman, how come she doesn't have a beard? No, if you have a woman with a beard, what would you say? To the circus. Didn't they have women with beards in the circus? Why? Because, because it's unnatural for a woman to have a beard, but it's natural for a man to have a beard. Now, the problem with Muslims is that we look at a Muslim man with a beard and think that he's righteous. You're not righteous because you have a beard. If you're wearing a beard because the prophet wore one and that's his sunnah, then you get credit for wearing a beard. Allah will give you a good reward, reward for just wearing the beard trying to be like the prophet. But it doesn't necessarily make you righteous. If having a beard makes you righteous, let's go to the park, let's go find the bum with a beard and say, behold, the righteous man. <laughs> Not that a beard is insignificant, but is less significant to other things that's more crucial and vital that we should discuss. Now, when I see a Muslim man without a beard, I make two assumptions. Assumption number one, he can't grow one. I know a brother in Brooklyn, he's like, <laughs> he, he trying to, he, he just can't. He, didn't want, he can't get a beard. It's all right, brother. You're a good Muslim. So the assumption, number one, he can't grow one. So what happens, we become very judgmental. We look at somebody without a beard, and we make all these kind of judgments. I'm better than him. I have a beard. My beard is longer. My beard is more henna in it. My beard less gray, more gray. And we make all of these assertions that doesn't, uh, doesn't add up to anything. And the sec second assumption, I assume that if he cut it, he cut it for a reason that may be legitimate. I was um, in Pensacola last night, Sheikh, and I had lunch at a, at a, at a restaurant, a fish restaurant. And, and again, and I, see, brother and sister, I, see, I don't, I don't mind mentioning names and countries, but I learned that people get offended and they think that you're talking against them, so I don't mention the countries. Because it's more important, the principle is more important than the personality. So whether I name the country or not is, is irrelevant. But know what he told me? It's a Muslim country. And he said that in his country, he's a Muslim. He said in his country, 
the, a Muslim woman is not allowed to wear a scarf. And a Muslim man cannot wear a beard except with the permission of the government. So therefore, if a man cut his beard, why he cut his beard? I don't know. I teach what the prophet said and leave it for the brothers and the sisters to make their decisions. Sometimes we major in the minor and we minor in the major. So the things that we really need to talk about, we don't talk about. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm going to try to tie this together in the next few minutes. Just try to bear with me. I want you to keep everything in mind. I said my observation is that every animal has what? A natural enemy. I'm going to call your attention to a book that you have to read. You have to read, brothers and sisters. The book that I'm about to tell you is a classic. Written, 50, uh, written 500 years before Christ. This book is so important in Western civilization that many major corporations make it required reading for top management. Probably all of you got the book read. I shouldn't even mention it. But I guess I'll mention it. It's called The Art of War by Sun Tzu. S-U-N-T-Z-U. You must read the book. How many of you have it? Raise your hand. Good. How many don't have it? How many are going to get it? Good. Two things he said in this book I want you to think about. Number one, he said, if a man knows himself, but he doesn't know his enemy, he will be successful 50% of the time. And he will fail 50% of the time. And if a man doesn't know himself and he doesn't know his enemy, he will always fail. And if a man knows himself and knows his enemy, he will be successful. Number two, and this is really, really heavy. It's heavy. I'm going to put number two here. Let's see if it, keep it there for a second, okay? Would you remind me that I have it here? Okay, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Question number one, how many of you in this audience believe in Allah, the supreme being, or God? Raise your hand. Very good, very good. How many of you believe in his prophets? Raise your hand. Good. How many of you believe in the scriptures that the prophets bought? Raise your hand. Good. How many of you believe in angels? Life after death? Good. How many of you believe in the devil? Again, how many believe in the devil? Raise your hand. Okay, good. Put your hand down. Let me give you some news. You don't believe in the devil. You acknowledge the existence of the devil, and there's a major difference. You never find in Quran or Hadith, I meant to be shaitan, <laughs> right? You don't believe in the shaitan. He's real. He exists. Yeah, he is. But belief is not just mere uh, acknowledgement. You don't just acknowledge the existence of Allah. You believe in him, you have faith in him, you trust him, you depend upon him. More about that at another time, but it's really a deep statement. Now, question. Listen to what Allah says in the Quran. Inna shaytana lakum aduun fataqiduhu aduwa. The devil is your enemy. So take him as an enemy. The devil is real. Christians teach it. It's in the, in the Bible. It's in the Torah. Musa, Moses taught it. It's in the Angel, the Gospel. Jesus taught it. All the prophets talked about this creature called Shaitan. He's the enemy of man. The white man is not the enemy of man, necessarily. No, 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 stop it. No, stop it. I'm saying necessarily, there's some white people are enemies of man, but there's some black people are enemies of man. 
There are some men that are enemies to men, and there are women, a few, <laughs> that might almost be an enemy to man. Now, Allah mentioned in Quran that this enemy called Shaitan, he sees us from where we can't see him. Now, I'm going to ask you a critical theological question. It's strictly theological, as a Jew, as a Christian, as a Muslim. Can the shaitan, can the devil kill you? Physically. Can't do it. You know why? It's against the rules of engagement. He can doubt to care. He can invite you. He can influence you. He could try to trick you, but he can't kill you. He can't physically hurt you. So the weapon of the devil, shaitan, is not his hands, but is his voice, his whisper, his deception. Now, what's over here? Number two, Sun Tzu said, the greatest achievement in war, listen carefully, is to be able to defend, to defeat your enemy without shedding a drop of blood. Defeat your enemy without shedding a drop of blood. Now let's put all this together. The sleep, the sheep, television, rocking people to sleep, the masses of the people sleep. I was in Philadelphia recently attending a national imams meeting, Muslim leaders, and we had some sisters who came. One of the sisters came to me and said, Imam Saraj, I want to let you know I'm going to be making noise I'm going to be making noise. I said, go ahead, sister. See, I know what she meant. She said, she was saying her voice is going to be heard, and whether people like it or not, she's going to be making noise. Sid, Sidman Freud said that, he said, it's my fate to agitate the sleep of man. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm going to do some agitating in the next couple of minutes. I'm going to tell you the truth. How many of you heard of Malcolm X and Haj Malik Shabazz? Raise your hand. How old was he when he died? Malcolm X was just short of his 40th birthday. Malcolm X was a noisemaker. And that's why he was assassinated. Martin Luther King Jr., have you heard of him? How old was he when he died? Just short of his 40th birthday. How old was Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, when he became a prophet? 40 years old. What's the age of full development for a man? 40 years old. Martin Luther King Malcolm X were great because they were noisemakers. Prophet Muhammad, Prophet Jesus, Prophet Moses, Solomon, David, Noah, Abraham, all of them were noisemakers to wake up the society for their own good. Take what I'm going to say or let it alone. Wallahi, I swear by Allah, the Muslims in America mean nothing but good for the American people. I'm telling you, the best thing that happened to the American people, you may not know it yet, you'll learn it soon, is the Muslims. But we got a problem. Let me tell you what the problem is. Go back to the Bible and go back to the Quran, and one of the chief enemies among man, for man, is a character called Pharaoh. 
or Fir'aun. In the Bible called Pharaoh, in the Quran called Fir'aun. There were some people with Fir'aun. Who were they? Hmm? Magicians. Right? Magicians, they, they, they deal in magic. The same way you had magicians in the time of Fir'aun, I'm telling you, we have modern magicians who are so good that they can make enemies look like friends. And they make friends look like enemies. You just, just listen to me. You got you to hear me out. Because I'm not coming to make friends. The book that I study from is the Quran and not Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's wrong for Muslims, in my opinion, to sit, to stand in front of the people and just you know, rehearse some very beautiful, oh, we just so beautiful people, so beautiful, you all so beautiful, we so beautiful. I think it's critical that we tell the truth. That yes, definitely Muslims want peace. Allah enjoins upon us to establish peace, but he also tells us to establish justice. And it's wrong to go around the country just saying Islam is for peace and not deal with the injustice that are being perpetrated against Muslims and other people around the world. Never, ever did any prophet close their mouth and say, oh, I'm just going to bring peace. No, 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 no. Name the prophet. And they brought peace, but they also talked about justice, and they talked about the commandments of Allah. I'm tired of being on the defensive. Now it's time for us to speak out. Now, brothers and sisters, think about this. There's a sister in our community. She does official name changes. In America, there are a lot of African Americans, like myself, like Imam Zaid Shakir, like Bilal Phillips, Abdullah Hakim Jackson, Abdul Hakim Quick, and many of them who became Muslims. And then we changed our names. You don't know my name. I mean, you don't know the name I was born with. You know Siraj Wahaj. But you remember Cat Stevens? What's his name now? Yusuf Islam. And I give you a long list of those Muslims who changed their names. You know the sad irony? That this sister who does name changes over the last few months is changing the names in the opposite direction. From Muslim names, legally changing it to un-Islamic, non-Muslim names. Why? Because of the climate and the fear in the hearts of Muslims now, feeling that they are target. So Muslims begin to change the identity from a Islamic identity to an un-other than Islamic identity so as to protect themselves. I understand it. Not, no problem, I understand. I'm not, I'm not even really, be, that's not even my issue. I'm just gonna make a bigger point than that. The point I want to make, brothers and sisters, that in my conclusion, our job here in America is to be like the Prophet Muhammad والسلام, when Allah says, Ma rasalnaka illa rahmati lil alameen. I've only sent you as a mercy to all of the worlds. But brothers and sisters, you can't help these people if you don't tell them the truth. What truth? In my conclusion, can this thing come out? Now I'm really gonna do something crazy now. I'm sorry. Run sisters, um, a couple weeks ago, so you'll remember, I was in New York City, and by the way, 
I'm on, I'm on a plane every, every weekend. Virtually every weekend, I'm on the, on the plane going somewhere. And I'm telling you now, I am profiled all the time. I go to LaGuardia Airport, my luggage, and I go like everybody else on the uh, you know, uh, curbside checking. And everybody being checked in, checked in, right? So I come there, and they say, well, I'm sorry, sir, you have to go inside. This is just random checking. That's all right, no problem. So I go inside, take my luggage inside, I go to the ticket agent, and, and the ticket agent said, well, sorry, sir, you got to go over there for screening. Now, nobody else is getting screened, but I got to go for screening, right? And, said, and they said, oh, don't worry, it's just random checking. So I said, all right. So I go there, and they go to my bag, and they, you know, looking at your personal stuff. Ah, you know, looking at your stuff. Ugh. So, okay, you're fine. So I go and get my ticket. And I go to security like everybody else. And after I come to the security, I clear security. They say, sir, step right this way, please. You see, every once in a while, we're taking someone out the line. This is a random check-in. So everybody else going through, going through, and going through, right? Even people that beep, they go through. But me, they check me. No, no problem. It's okay. So now I go to the terminal, sitting down, waiting to get on the plane. Right, and I'm going. I said, well, fine, I'm getting on the plane now. About to go on the plane. I said, sir, please, you got to come this way. I said, I know, random, random check it. They said, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so now you have to imagine now, right? I'm standing there, my hands like this. They're checking me, and all the people going on the plane looking at me. And I'm by myself, right? So when I get in the plane now, everybody's already in the plane, right? So I come there like this, and everybody looking at me. <laughs> and get in my seat. Because, <laughs> you're becoming a problem man, right. Now, brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. Nobody likes to be spit upon. That's, that's human nature. But what makes it worse, don't spit on me and call it rain. Is, is, is it raining? Right? Now, now people are looking at me as if I am the enemy. Allah knows I'm not the enemy. And I, I became a Muslim to make America better. It's foolish for people to think that, that Muslims hate America. How could you hate America? And I am in America. I am an American. I'm a Muslim. I'm an American. I'm an Aswadu. I'm a Muslim. I'm an American. I'm an American. How can, nowhere in the Quran does it say hate Americans. Nowhere in the Quran does it say hate, hate the West. No, 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 no. So now, a whole lot of people being pulled out of line, a whole lot of people in jail simply because of their name, sound Muslim, or they look uh, Arab, or they look Islamic, or they dress Islamic, and they're being profiled. And now some of my Muslim brothers and sisters who migrated to this country now understand the plight of the African American who've always been profiled. And now I'm profiled first as an, uh, uh, an African American and now I'm profiled as a Muslim too. So now I go to LaGuardia Airport on my way to Atlanta, Georgia. So I get on the plane. And where am I going? Atlanta, Georgia. Just want to see if you're listening. Where am I going? Now, I don't know about you. When I get on a plane, I don't go to sleep. Keep your eyes open. Because some strange stuff be happening on the plane. So I like to sit on the, in the window seat. So I'm sitting in the window seat, right? Buckled up. And the plane takes off. Zoom. And I'm looking, you know. And I'm looking. I say, ah. Oh. There's Shea Stadium, yeah, and we fly in, and I said, oh yeah, there's, 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 there's the Bronx over there, and there's Yankee Stadium, yeah, yeah, I see it, and I'm flying, I'm saying, oh, and there's the George Washington Bridge, and I'm flying, I said, oh, there's Yonkers, and I said, well, wait a minute, we're going north. In Atlanta, Georgia, South. So, okay, I'm watching this stuff now, right? And I'm, and I'm saying to myself now, as the plane continues to fly northward, 
I'm saying, okay, Mr. Pilot, turn. And the plane's still going. I said, well, you got to turn now. And it's still going. And all of a sudden, it starts to turn 180 degrees. And now it's going in the right direction. How do I know? Because I was awoke and able to see the landmarks, recognize the signs. But if you sleep, you can't see the signs. And if you sleep, you can't recognize the landmarks. And you're going in the wrong direction and don't even realize you're going in the wrong direction because you sleep and the shepherd won't wake you up and tell you that you're going in the wrong direction. Question. In America, whose hands are on the throttle and whose feet are on the brakes? They're not your hands. They're not your feet. Our leadership is making and will continue to make critical errors that will hurt all of us. And you're a fool not to say anything. Like good people, righteous people, and evil people on a ship, and the evil people begin to drill a hole in the ship. And the prophet said, if you don't stop him, you destroy yourself and you destroy him. And if you, let, if, if you, don't, and if you uh, stop him, you save him and you save yourself. But you can't save the American people if you don't speak the truth. If you're too jittery, too afraid, I don't want to, I'm, I'm, we're just like you, we're exactly the same. No, 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 we're not just exactly the same. This is why you have the Quran, you have truth. You have the son of the prophet shared with the people. And now we must go beyond rhetoric. And I'm saying this last thing, and I'm serious about this, brothers and sisters. We as Muslims must end the extremism in our own communities. Fight against it. Speak out against it. It's wrong, brother. I'm not down with that. Nah, uh-uh. I'm following the example of Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. You know, brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, magic, you want me to tell you the magic, the modern day magicians? In my opinion, the modern day magicians is the magic of the media. And don't think media is some nebulous, oh, the media is against us. What media? Who are you talking about? Media is people with agendas. Some people are ignorant, we give them that. Some don't know, we give them that. Others know exactly what they're doing. And they're trying to paint you with a broad brush as evil, wicked people, and they know that's not the case. But now we got to fight and defend ourselves and defend ourselves and defend ourselves while they go scot-free. I'm not going for it. Prophets gave their lives to teach the truth. Our fight, brothers and sisters, not with guns and knives and bombs. That's so foolish. That's not our fight. Our fight is simply the truth as we know it. The last thing I want to say, I was, uh, got a phone call from Fox News. Imam Suraj, uh, we're very happy with the work that you've done since 9-11. We want you to come on our show and talk about the great work that you're doing. I said, you want me to come on your show to talk about the great work I'm doing? They said, yeah, Imam Suraj, everybody in America ought to know you the one. I said, I'm the one? They said, you the one. I, I, I believe them. What's the name of that show? Fox, um, huh? No, not O'Reilly. Yeah, Hannity, there you go. And so I'm saying, I'm telling everybody, I said, yeah, guess what? I'm going, I'm going on Fox News, man. So I get to the studio, man, and, and, and you know, they put the makeup on me. That was new. They said, you, you shining too much. I said, yeah, I bet I'm shining too much. So, man, I mean, I mean, really, 
I'm saying it didn't even hit the thing yet. I'm, I'm about to sit, didn't even hit the thing yet. I'm about to sit down, and they got the camera on me. They say, Imam Saraj, isn't it true that the Quran says that the Muslims shouldn't take the Christians and Jews as friends and protectors? Didn't the Quran say that? And isn't this bigotry? I thought you wanted me to talk about what I was doing. Now, this is an attack on the Quran. Not a problem. We can defend the Quran. It's the word of Allah. Allah honored me to say something on behalf. Allah don't need me. Allah honored me on behalf of him to say something about the Quran. I said, the problem is you don't know the Quran and you don't know Arabic and you take things out of context. How dare you? And people do this and it's sickening. You take a book, 114 chapters, that was revealed in, in, in 23 years. You have the audacity to take a verse out of it, out of context, throw it out there, no explanation, no nothing, and you weren't after me, you were after those millions of people that were listening and watching to say that, see, you see, what it, see how Islam is? Against Christians and Jews. And I said, well, since you asked, let me tell you something. Let me quote what it says. Oh, you who believe, don't take the Christians and Jews as awliya. What does awliya mean? It's the plural of the word wali. What does wali mean? One of the names of Allah, El Wali. He's the protector. This is why, sisters, when you read the hadith of the Prophet, he says, La nikaha illa biduni wali. There's no marriage without what, a friend? There's no marriage without a friend? It's stupid. It's asinine. Is asinine okay? It's, a, it's okay? <laughs> Just don't get excited. So now, no, don't, there's no marriage without a guardian, a protector. Your father is your natural guardian. Your father protects his daughter. That's what the, that, what, that's what the hadith is saying. Now, now listen, everyone knows, everyone knows that Muslims are allowed to marry the people of the book. Who are the people of the book? Christians and Jews. Think about this, Allah is saying in the same Quran, you permitted to marry the people of the book. So what are you saying? You can marry them but don't be friends to them. <laughs> Come on, silly, it's silly. So brothers and sisters, I'm, I'm, I'm finished. I'm saying to you, trust this, trust me. If the American people knew Muslims for what they're supposed to be, they would want them to be their neighbors. Muslims are not even allowed to hurt animals unjustly. Meaning what? You are able to, you're allowed to slaughter an animal to eat. But even when you do it, you have to make sure there's no suffering of the animal. And you have to sharpen your blade so that the animal doesn't suffer. Even our tradition taught us that a woman, a prostitute, gave water to a dog. And Allah forgave that prostitute for giving water to a dog. Our tradition taught us that a woman was punished in the hellfire because she tortured a cat. How much more so with human beings? I'm on the plane. Now I'm on the plane and this, this little white woman, old woman, she's negotiating with her luggage trying to get it up there on, in, the, in the overhead. She can't do that. I said, ma'am, let, uh, let me do that. She said, you can do that? I said, yeah. <laughs> I said, let me, and I always do, I always do that. It don't matter, woman, man, black, white, don't make me a difference. I said, why you do that? You, you're a Muslim. Why do it? Because I'm a Muslim. That's what I'm supposed to do. You're not gonna have no threat with me. Wanna, do you, you, wanna, you wanna check me against myself. I'm not gonna do nothing to myself, nor you. And let me tell you this thing about suicide. Let nobody fool you. Somebody was right when they said suicide is a permanent solution for a temporary problem. All these problems can be worked out. And you as a Muslim, we as Muslims have to be patient and do it in the best way. And even when Muslims have to fight to defend themselves, America's fighting to defend herself, then why are you now apologizing that in the Islamic Sharia you, give, you have a right to defend yourself? 
And sometimes, brothers and sisters, you have to fight to defend yourself. But even if you do, Allah says, وَقَاتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَلَا تَعْدَدُوا إِنَّ اللَّهِ لَا يُحِبُّ مُتَذِينَ Fight in the way of Allah, those who fight against you, but even then, don't go beyond the boundaries. And don't be aggressive. So even in war, there's rules of engagement. If you're Muslim, you follow those rules of engagement and you never take innocent lives. Never! Never take innocent lives. No. Don't let the media fool you in a way we can get around that. Show that we mean the good for America is to live our creed and be the best Muslims that we can be. May Allah bless us and help us. Assalamu alaikum wa Um, thank you, Imam Suraj, for that amazing presentation, alhamdulillah. Uh, we just have a few minutes for questions and answers, but the format will be different this time. Uh, we will be handing out note cards and pens, um, and the ushers, if you can raise your hands. I don't, I don't mind if you just... You they can come up? Yes. Okay, okay, I yes. guess you can come up. Please. You have a, you have a mic over? Yes. yes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Imam Suraj al-Wahaj, uhibbuka fi Allah. I love you in the sake of Allah. I just want to make a correction mm -hmm. of a verse that you stated. Yes. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send us as ummatan wasata linakuna shuhada'a ala al nas. And you mentioned the interpretation or the meaning as balancing or in the middle. I want you to understand that wasatan in the Quran, if we look into it, Mean So here wasat means adil, justice. Mm -hmm. And it never meant to be in the middle. No so problem. we are ummatan wasatan ay udul. Why? Litakunu shuhada. Shahada, when you give a testimony, you must have adil. In order to give a testimony, you must be adil or just, have, yes. just. just that is so people know. Okay, so now I made this. Uh, hopefully, you take it from no, me. No, actually, <laughs> I, I want to stop you for one second, Sheikh. And yes, actually, sir. I knew that and accepted that. Actually, what I what I did, I wasn't giving my own uh, interpretation of that. By the way, this is an interpretation of many people that I read, including Maududi. But I do accept that Imam, and I did read that, and I do agree with you. And I think one of the things I will, you, you do know that the the, the the Quran is very comprehensive. And a lot of shades of meaning, but so so you're right. I accept that. Jazakallah khairan. And just last comment about uh, the suicide and the defend. Yes. If you read the Judeo-Christian heritage, you find right there that things that they allow for themselves, but they prohibit it on others. We read in the chapter of, or the book of Judges, the second book of Judges, about a man by the name, we called him Shamshun, Simon. Samson. Uh, Samson, and this man was so powerful and his power was in his hair. One, a woman by name Dalila, she anyhow gave him to his enemy. And that man, he made the palace collapse over three, thousand people and he is among the righteous this is one thing i want you to know and that is in the book of judges beloved let, imam let me say this to you yes i'm very familiar with that right but understand what i'm doing and, and and try to understand the context of what i'm saying right i'm not talking about i'm making a general statement a general statement hear carefully what i'm saying i'm making a very very general statement right and if i had time I would talk in specifics about different places around the globe, and, and I would, one of the things I would want to talk about without justifying anything, I would like to talk about conditions that create a person to be so uh, uh, hopeless uh, or, uh, you know, that, that, that may, uh, conditions that may result in people doing extreme things. 
And, and if that was the context of what I want to talk about, I would do that. I'm, you, I'm talking about something different now, right? First context I'm talking about, in context of here, in America, a lot, and we got to be very careful about that. In the context of here, we talk about the pop, the topic is coexisting. So I don't want to I don't want to send a signal that you know I, I want to justify this and I want to justify that. I'm not even doing that. I'm not even going that way. So I, though, though I understand what you're saying, and 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 but believe me, I appreciate exactly what you're saying. And I know exactly where you're coming from, and I do appreciate it. May Allah bless you. Just last thing I am okay. done, I am sorry to take. I know that this is haram, and it is not Islamic, whether to hijack an aeroplane, whether to hit a building. This is un-Islamic, and this is not the way Muslims solve their problems. So I am against that, and I am not with it. But, but all what I am saying is that our fight today is intellectual. Yes. Our fight today is mental. Yes. Truth yes. and falsehood. Yes. And we have to show Islam in reality. Absolutely. And talk about what wrong here. Thank yes. you. Yes. Thank you, Imam. Thank you very much. I probably had time for one. We actually over time now because I just, you know, I just thought it took the time. Oh, oh yeah. Ah, thank you. Brothers and sisters, I understand that the group here, it's a marvelous program, by the way. I think they did a wonderful job. And um, they're kind of over their budget. So they need this $2,000. And I'm just gonna ask you, just to help them out, really one person could do it, and you know, just one person, I said, I'll do it. Anyone here that said, I'll give it, I'll give $2,000 for this group. Can anyone, one person do that? Just, yeah, can one person? You look like you wanna do it, you got that look. You, anyone can do a two thousand dollars? Just for this, the so let me ask you this one: Can someone take the responsibility and give it other people and do the two thousand? That's all they want is two thousand dollars to supplement uh, their, their 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 budget. They went over the budget. Can anyone do that? Can anyone take the responsibility and get them with some other brothers and sisters and do the do the two thousand? I like, but brother, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. So you see him. Raise your hand again. So. You see who he is? Asma, you see him? You see him? So let's go get him, right? <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I, you know, um, may Allah bless this conference and bless the organizers. I uh, think they're doing a wonderful job. And, you know, and bless all of you. And please, brothers and sisters, my, if I can give you one message in one sentence, I would say to you, be not afraid. Just don't be afraid. Allah is with you. Just be yourself. Just be the good Muslims that, that you are. Uh, and, and remember, there's no shame in being weak. The shame is remaining weak. Because Allah says, Khulik al insan and da'if, and everybody is created weak. But don't stay weak. Continue to grow. Al mu'minu qawiyu khayru muhabbu ilallah minu mu'min da'if wa fi khulin khayr. A strong believer is better and more loved by Allah than a weak believer. But there's good in all of them. Stay strong and stay in the word of the Quran and the words of the Messenger of Allah. Thank you.